Love it. I love it when the church gets rowdy. I just don't know about it. I love it. How, and it's, it's a holiday weekend. Come on, somebody. You're in church. The weather is bad, but you're in church, and that is good. Hey, no, seriously, as Pastor Mark says, and I know that all of our campus pastors express this, but happy Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a time where we honor and remember those that have gone before us, those who have willingly paid the price for freedom that we enjoy because the reality is that freedom is not free. And Come on, that's right. And all of the fun and the time off that we get this weekend, I pray that, that we would all take a moment in the middle of the festivity and just stop and remember and be thankful because freedom is the great, greatest gift that any of us could ever have or enjoy. Come on, can we just thank God for that? Amen? Amen. So I wanna, can I just jump into the word already? Can I just get to it? I want to share today about in this third week of this revival series, and I pray that this revival series is blessing the church. I want to share one of the best and one of the most out-of-the-box miracles that is found in the Bible. In fact, it's recorded in the book of Mark. So if you have your Bibles, I want to read this to you. So if you have your Bibles, let's go there. If you have your iPhones, your iPads, my only request is, you know, just keep your eyelids open for the next 20 minutes or so. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. And I understand that my jokes aren't even funny today, so you don't even have to laugh, right? Because you're not. Um, uh, so here we go. This is a miracle that Jesus performs. It's a unique miracle because it's the only place that you'll find this miracle in Scripture, right here in the middle of the book of Mark. It's kind of one of kind, it's a one of a kind miracle. It's a one off miracle. It's not recorded anywhere else, nor did Jesus do this miracle this way at any other time. So there's something special about it, and I just believe that there's something that we can extract from it today, and I believe it will speak to our life in the here and now. Are you ready for it? All right, Mark chapter 8 verse 22. It says this. Then he, bless you. Uh, then he <laughs> Jesus I love you. I, I have ADD severely, so <laughs> forgive me. It's not you. If it was somebody else, I would have said it. All right. Then he, Jesus, came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man. Now, that's all I can think about. They brought a blind man. They brought a blind man. They brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged Jesus to touch him. Isn't it interesting how they come to Jesus, and they just kind of tell Jesus the expectation? Like, Jesus... We brought somebody to you. Now this is our expectation. Heal our friend. Isn't it also amazing how sometimes we have a better idea than God Almighty? Isn't it crazy that we tell God what we want him to do most of the time? And when he doesn't do what we want him to do, sometimes that will, that will kind of get us burnt out and bitter. And, and we get a grudge and hold a grudge against our God. Are you tracking with me, somebody? They're just going to tell, tell God how to do it. That's, that's what they were doing. The people said, we want you to touch this guy. We want you to touch our friend, and let's see what happens. And then something happens in verse 23. It says, so he, Jesus, took the blind man by the hand and led him out. I just love this in this story that Jesus reached out to the blind man. We don't know if there are any words exchanged. We don't know if they had any exchange at all. We don't know if they fist bumped, high-fived, or gave a hug. We don't know what's happening. And even being blind, this man probably didn't know what was going on around his life. But I just love how Jesus reached out to this man. And can I tell you today that I am so thankful, I am so glad, I am so honored that in my blindness, that in my failure, that in my sin, that God Almighty reached out to me. Come on, somebody. When I couldn't reach out to him, he reached out to me. And he's going to reach out to you as well, even if you don't know up from down, left or right. You can't see your way out. You don't know how to talk your way out. You don't know how you got here. I just want to tell and remind somebody today that Jesus Christ is still reaching out to those that desire him. Amen. Making me preach. Jesus reached out. To the blind man. It goes on to say also that 
that he reached out to him and then he led him out of that town. He, he led him out, like he walked him out. And this is just such a good point that I could stop here and preach for a hot minute, right? Because sometimes you've got to be willing to get outside of yourself. Sometimes you've got to be willing to get outside of your comfort zone so that you can go to where God is wanting to take you. Sometimes we've got to get outside of our past. We've got to get outside of our yesterday. We've got to get outside of that habit, outside of that sin, outside of that tradition so that Jesus can take you to a place that he's desiring to take you. Sometimes we've got to get outside of our comparison. I'm preaching whether you want me to or not this morning. Sometimes we've got to get outside of what's social acceptable so that we can see clearly what Jesus wants to do in our life. Sometimes we've got to get outside of what's old so that we can walk into what's new. Sometimes we need to close the door so that God can keep a door open that he wants us to walk through. So Jesus took him outside of that town. And I want you to notice what the scripture, scripture begins to tell us that Jesus does something extraordinarily odd. He, he does something totally crazy. And this is your Jesus. This is my Jesus. This is your Bible. I'm not making this up. The Bible says that Jesus spit in his eyes. He spit in his eyes. This is what's nuts about this story. I can't find Jesus doing this in any other scenario where he makes the blind see. He spit in this man's eyes and he puts his hands on him and he asked him if he saw anything. What an interesting question from the Savior of the world. Do you see anything? <sighs> this guy's like, what are we doing? <laughs> Jesus, what are we doing? Right? Whoa, do you see anything? And the man looks up and he says, I see, kind of. I see, but it's not clear. I see, I see men and people like trees. They're walking around. He had tree sight, but that wasn't enough. And sometimes what I know is that I have tree sight. We have tree sight. Sometimes we need to take some time to see things clearly. Sometimes we have a blurred vision. And that blurred vision could come from our own hurt. It could come from our own failures. It could come from our own pain, our own situations. And Jesus says, what do you see? And this blind man says, I see men walking around like trees. And I just want to tell you that that's not enough because God doesn't heal partially. God heals completely. Amen. It's okay to have a Augusta clap every once in a while. Then Jesus, the Bible says, puts his hands. This is my favorite part of this whole scripture. And this is why I feel like preaching this word today. He puts his hands on his eyes again. Everybody say again. I love this word again. Jesus puts his hands on this man's eyes again. Again. And he made him look up. And he was restored. And he saw everyone clearly. In verse 26, it's good as all the other verses. The Bible says that he sent him away to his house and said, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Another version says it like this. Don't go back the same way as you go back home. Because sometimes when God does a work in your life, he wants to take you another way. Sometimes God wants to do something in your life and he doesn't want you returning to those old friends, those old habits, those old mindsets, that old attitude. He wants to bring you into a new way because now you can see clearly. Can I get a good amen for God's word, somebody? I just love this miracle. I love the fact that Jesus laid his hands on him again, again. And I just want to say, do it again, Jesus. Can someone say that with me? Do it again, Jesus. Come on, one more time. Do it again, Jesus. I have a quick question for you. How many struggle with direction? Come on, all the men. There needs to be, there's a lot of men that's lying up in this place. I see you. Come on, rising sun, struggle with direction. Now, here's the, I don't, 
I don't struggle just with direction. I don't have a directional issue. I have, I have, I have been spiritually gifted with distractions. <laughs> now, how many love GPS? Come on, somebody. You love GPS? You won't buy a car unless it's got leather seat warmers and a GPS. You know what I'm saying? A global positioning system. It doesn't matter where your butt is on the globe. It can find you and get you out of a mess. Come on. Global positioning system. I just want to tell you, I love me some GPS. But let me tell you about my dad. Here is a pic of my dad, right? My dad doesn't buy into the global <laughs> positioning system. My dad goes old school. Old school. Is there any truckers in the house? Come on. Is it? Anyways. This is us going on a day ride on our motorcycle. This is how we roll. This is us in an RV. My dad, he loves him some Atlas. He loves, in fact, the other day I was trying to clean out and throw some things away, and I was throwing out an Atlas. He's like, no, son, not today, not on my watch. And he has a collection of them. He's got big rigs. He's got medium rigs. I'm telling you, he loves to be able to figure it out. And I know there's power in it because I can, he can tell me the roads that have certain height of overpasses. You know what I mean? I mean, he's genius. I can't read it. He can. He loves him. Some old school atlases. And they're probably one of the greatest gifts he's ever given me in his mind is when he bought me my first <laughs> atlas. Now, again, I don't have a problem with directions, but I do have a problem with distractions. I can't count how many times did I pass my road? And I have to make a U-turn on 23 to come back to High Point. It's just Grafton Shop and High Point. I'm dealing with two left turns. You know what I'm saying? And I, I get to 165 and I'm like, yep, I missed it. I, I guess I do have a directional issue. But I'm thankful for the travel apps. You know what I'm talking about, the travel apps? How many love them some Google Maps? How many love them some Apple Maps? Come on, somebody. How many love them some Waze? Yeah, come on. Yeah, yesterday I was riding my wife, and they're like, speed light camera ahead. I'm like, what? Like, thank God for the blood. I'm just telling you. Like, I appreciate every police officer in here, but I love and be some, me some travel maps. And, and you know what my favorite feature is with it when it comes to these travel apps and maps and such? And I believe Jesus was all over it. Like, I'm telling you, these things were born out of grace and mercy. I mean, I'm serious. It's been covered. My favorite feature, hands down, is this. It's called the reroute. The reroute. How many love them some rerouting? I'm telling you, sometimes I'll just go the wrong way because, first of all, I don't want to be told what to do. And <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And second of all, like, I want to see if I can get out of this. You know what I'm saying? Like, this, I know it wants me to go that way, but this way looks better. And I love my options. How many love their options? You know I'm preaching to you, like, I'm not by myself. I love me some options, and I love me some rerouting. It has saved me again and again and again. It lets me know when I go the wrong way. It lets me know when I'm looking in the wrong direction. It lets me know when I've passed high point, and I've, and I, yeah, I put it in, I'm going home. It, it'll speak to me and say, wait, I'm about to give you a second chance. Hey, wait, you missed it right here, but I'm about to reroute you. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to reroute you and reroute you and reroute you again. As long as you're lost, I'm going to keep rerouting you. It never stops illuminating. It never starts enlightening a new way to my path. It loves me so much because it stays with me and it will do it again. Freedom Church, this is a place of rerouting. Amen. We have been called to be a church to reroute. We serve a God that reroutes. We serve a God that doesn't give up on us the first time. When we're heading down the wrong path, I'm going to reroute you. I'm going to, I don't care how far you've gone, where you've been, what you've done. It's time for a reroute. Come on. Amen. We don't serve a once chance Jesus. We don't serve a we, we we serve a second chance Jesus. We serve a thousandth chance Jesus. Why? Because it's the heartbeat of Jesus. Sometimes we need correction for the wrong direction. Sometimes we need to see people 
differently. Because Jesus sees us differently. Sometimes we just need help. I don't know about you, but there are times when I feel lost. I feel overwhelmed. And some of us have this current times or living in this present world fatigue. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You feel the pain of this world. We look around and we see hate and we see hurt. We see hungry. We see uncertainty. We see job loss, family trauma, addiction, anxiety, stress. And we're like, how in the world are we going to get out of this? We're going to make it because we serve a God that can rework us, redirect, it, re redirect us. We serve a God that will do it again. He'll put his hands on our eyes again. Amen. I'm excited to preach this sermon today, as if you can tell. Do you know why I love this miracle? Do you know why I love this story so much? Do you know why I get excited to preach about this kind of stuff? It's because sometimes I, didn't get, I don't get it right the first time. Because sometimes I need a second time. Sometimes I need a a 20th time. Sometimes I wish I got it right the first time. I wish I was a great husband from the jump. I wish I was a perfect dad for the, from the first moment. I wish I saw people as I needed to see them the first time. I don't. In fact, through this season, my heart has gotten bitter and God's tried to get me better. Can I get somebody? Can I get a good amen, somebody? <laughs> amen. And God Almighty comes down like the awesome GPS system that he is and he reroutes me and he puts some fresh grace on me some fresh mercy in my life because sometimes I don't say the right things I don't act the right way and I'm so glad that God redirects me I'm so thankful that God gives us some grace and some mercy and he gives us a second chance I'm thankful I'm thankful for the story I'm so glad we're having church today I'm so glad I get to see your face today because we serve a God that can do it again. We do. This is one of those sermons that it's really not for your neighbor. I know what you're thinking. Well, I hope so-and-so hears this. No, this is when you, just about the time you say that, this is for us. I'm preaching to myself. I'm so grateful that I get to live in this story because there have been times that I've needed God to help me again. There have been times where I needed his hands to touch my eyes again. And if I'm just honest with you, sometimes it's over the very same thing. It's over the same thing. You know, I'm so thankful that when I came to Christ, it was an immediate moment. It was a miracle that I got saved. My salvation happened in a moment. God saved me. It was a miracle moment. But guess what? It was not just a miracle in a moment. I became a work in progress. Is there anybody else today with me that you're a work in progress? Come on, half the building. We're a work in progress. I came to Christ in a moment, but it was clear I was also going to be a miracle in motion. Because there is a difference between justified by faith and walking out sanctification somebody. It was clear that my salvation happened in a moment, but the grace work, the mercy work, the truth work, the freedom work, man, that would happen in progression. It would happen in motion, and I'm so thankful for that. I am glad for all the gracious and patient and loving people that have been around me all of my life and continue to be around me. I've had some pastors, I've had some leaders that have taken me by the hand, and I promise you, I am so embarrassed by some of the issues I put people through, but I'm so grateful that someone didn't give up on me and if you don't have someone in your life that's telling you yes and also telling you no I'm telling you, you need to get into a group you need to get around some people that can tell you no amen I'm so glad that they were patient with me I'm so thankful that the process that happened in my life because Jesus was still opening up my eyes that's why we need a next step today that's why we need to join up in a summer small group. That's why we need to jump in on the growth track. That's why we need to take a spiritual next step in the journey because it's quite possible that Jesus is still opening up your sight. Can I get a good amen? amen. It's just impossible to get it all the first time. Sometimes it just takes a little time. 
And here's the truth. We don't always all get better. We don't all get healed. We don't all get free. We don't all get whole at the same rate or in the same way. It's different for everyone. And I'm so thankful that we get to be a part of a church that's patient. And because being a revival church, it requires us to be a patient church. Thank God for the small groups that help us along the way. Why? Because we are people of a second chance. You're like, wait, you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand what this season has done to my soul. You don't understand maybe what this COVID season or this political season. Man, I have drifted from God this whole season. And maybe some of you are watching me today and you're watching maybe a week from now or two weeks from now or whenever. And you can relate to this that you've drifted from God. You don't understand. man. You're like, I have let some unhealthy habits into my life. Man, I've been missing church. I've been missing small group. I feel so far from God. And I just want to say this. That if he's rescued you once, he'll rescue you again. If he's done it for you once, he'll do it for you again. Well, I've lost my job. He can do that again. I've lost my scholarship. He can do that again. I've lost my family. He can restore again. I've lost hope in people. He can restore that. I'm telling you, he is the God that works in progression. Amen. I thank God for this miracle in Mark chapter 8. And I'm so thankful that the writer took the time and the courage to note that he laid his hands on his eyes again. I just wonder today on this holiday weekend, is there anyone here that desires to be touched by Jesus again? Come on, somebody. Let me give you some application today, just just a few helpful steps, and I'm just a little over 10 minutes, and we're going to close this thing down. I just believe God wants to do something special in all of our lives today, but come on, let's take these away today. Here's my first step from Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 26, and I believe that if we can walk in these and and live in these, man, our lives are just going to be better, and God could really truly see a revival set apart in our lives. And here's my first point, is we see people as they could be. I just love this. See people not as they are, but as they could be. Jesus sees people as they can be. I'm glad the blind guy had surrounded himself with friends that just didn't see him being blind. But they saw him as a seeing man. I'm so thankful that there have been people around my life that just didn't see my hang-ups and failures and as I truly was, but they saw someone differently. They saw through the lens of grace and saw what I could be. Aren't you grateful that you have people around you that don't just see, see you as you are and see what everybody may not see when you're alone, but they see some, something that has potential? I'm telling you today, here is a great tool to unlock in your life is we see people as they could be. They believed, these guys that were surrounded this blind man, they believed that Jesus could heal him. You know what I have found out about friends? Friends will either get you close to Jesus or they're going to get you far from Jesus. Someone told me one time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. How's your future looking right now? Because your friends will either get you closer to Jesus or they're going to get you further away. It's the same way. I'm on a soapbox today. It's, it's the same way with social media, right? Social media will either help you get closer to God or further away from God. And there are relationships that do this. We've got to see people as they could be. These friends that surrounded this guy believed that Jesus could heal him. They just thought, man, if we can just get our friend to Jesus, then everything's going to be okay. And I just want to say this is the big idea. Don't give up on people. Don't throw people away. It's not right. It's not what Jesus would do. I'm telling you, God didn't throw up on you. He didn't throw you aside. He didn't give up on you. I'm telling you, we have to have the heart of Jesus. Don't give up on people. I'm not going to give up on people because God's not giving up on people. See people as how they could be, not as they are. Come on, see them again. Point number two. We see growth as a process. We see growth as a progression. Sometimes the pain is in the process. 
Sometimes the beauty is in the process. Sometimes the miracle is in the process. That's why it's so important, again, for you to jump into a next step. That's why it's so important for you to jump into a growth track, jump into a small group, because growth is so much about process. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of time for me to be a better dad. It takes a little bit of time for a blended family. Sometimes it takes time to be single and then single again, right? Sometimes it takes time to be a student that's successful. I don't know about you, but I don't believe this man when he got his sight and he started walking back home, he saw all the trees, he saw the houses, he saw the beautiful sky, he saw the dog walk by and he saw the kids playing. I don't think he mumbled out a thought like, man, I got less of a miracle because Jesus had to touch me again. No, he wasn't comparing his miracle to anyone else. He wasn't upset because he got touched twice, right? He, he's not upset because his story didn't match on Facebook like blind, blind Bartimaeus. No, man, he just got touched. The miracle was in the process. Sometimes God will do stages in our life and will do something different in our life, but the miracle is all about seeing Jesus. Amen. Sometimes the miracles are gradual. Sometimes the miracles are immediate. Sometimes the miracles are eventual. But the process can still be supernatural. He didn't fight the process. He didn't fight the pattern. He didn't fight the fact that Jesus touched him again. He just leaned into the process. And I want to encourage our church today is to lean into the process. The process can still be supernatural. Sometimes it's not how we choose it. And I don't know about you, but I wish that every time I pray that God would answer that prayer. I wish that everything that God would do, he would do immediately. But I love how sometimes some of the things that God does, man, and I love this about God. Some things, some things that God does are just positional, right? It's, it's just his position. It's grace in the cross. It's in the shed blood of Jesus. Our salvation is immediate. But how many have found out that some things with God are progressive? Right? So please do not think it's less supernatural because God is doing something in you that's taking a little bit of time. Don't think it's less supernatural because he's touching your eyes again and again and again and again. Come on, don't compare yourself to someone else's process. Your process may be different than someone else, but it's not less supernatural than someone else. Come on. Amen. So we see growth. As a process. And here's my third point. And the band's running out because they're excited to play Do It Again. And it's an awesome song. See, we see potential for change. We see potential for change. Not too long ago, it was, it actually it was right before COVID season hit. It was before we even knew what was happening. We all were gathering together as a staff on a Saturday. Kind of like an annual get together. And as the pastor of the church, sometimes there's a responsibility on me to like bring a fresh word, bring something fresh. Have you ever had an expectation on your life when you really weren't walking in anything new or fresh? Come on, say anybody. Like just because maybe you're leading something doesn't mean like you, you feel like you're the leader of something. And I'm like walking in, I'm like, God, if I'm just honest, I, I really don't have a whole lot today. And I don't like the pressure. I don't want to feel the pressure. And all of a sudden, God just really, I wouldn't, it's not an audible voice when he speaks, but he just, he just puts something in you. And five words, actually five words came to my heart. And I didn't know why I was to share these five things. But one of those things was we're going to pray for a supernatural optimism. And I know, it's for, I, know, I know it's from God because I don't talk like that, right? Like, we're gonna pray as a team for supernatural optimism. We didn't know we were about to walk into COVID season. We didn't know that we were about to lock the church doors for weeks upon weeks upon weeks and months. But we began to pray before this season hit because God put a word in our spirit about about faith, about being positive, 
about not seeing the glass half empty, but rather, God, what are you saying to us? What are you doing, God? You must be up to something, God. What are you, man, I'm ready, God. Whatever you want, God, I, I have, I've got this supernatural optimism in my spirit. And I, and I just pray, we have referenced that so many times. And, you know, it's kind of funny because maybe some of our staff will say, man, I'm so thankful that God gave Pastor Wade that prophetic word. And I'm like, guys, if you only knew. I had to run back out to my car to write it down. I wasn't prepared. And sometimes when you're least prepared is when God will do his greatest work. Because you know what? It's not about you at the end of the day. It's about him. It's about us relying on him. Amen. But I pray today that you can walk away from this house, from, the, from our buildings with a supernatural optimism that maybe your miracle hasn't come yet, but we're all on a different timeline and that God is up to something, that God has got something different for your story. Because sometimes he heals one with a touch. He heals one with a word. He heals one with a look. He heals one from distance. The point is, whatever you need from God, he can do it and he'll do it again. Come on, he'll do it again. So keep the door open. Keep the door open because God can move with an open door. And here's my final point today. And I pray that this sermon is a blessing to you. And that is this, see and trust God's power. Because his power is enough and his power can do it again. We can't limit the way maker. Please don't limit the way maker. Please don't let doubt be the lid for a way-making God. Come on. Don't let bitterness be the lid of a way-making God. Don't let unforgiveness be a lid for a way-making God. Because here's what I promise you, is that God's faithfulness is still full of surprises. God's faithfulness is still full of surprises. I want to share this story in closing with you guys. It was 2009. 2009, and my wife and I and a few of the people that are still a part of the Freedom Team, we were working our best. We were putting forth our best effort, and so we thought. And the church wasn't growing. We had been kicked out of like six places. We had no building. We had no place to worship. Did you know that we baptized, we baptized 87 people last week? Crazy. It took us six years to get 87 people. Can I, can I just back up and say that again? It took us six years to get to the amount of people we baptized in a week. But let me tell you a part of the process. 2009, struggling, really doubting that I had a true call on my life to lead a church, to build a church, to pastor a church. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm visiting with some, there was like a pastoral ta round table, a room full of pastors, the exact people that I didn't want to be around because all pastors do, they, they brag. They do. I'm one of them. You better believe I'm bragging about baptizing 87 people. A good report makes the bones fat. That's why you got a fat pastor because we like to brag on what God has done. But I left that meeting early because I was so, I was so intimidated. I was so discouraged. And I even told God, God, if you could just let me do something else, if I could convince my wife to go do something else, I could go sell something, I could maybe a lot of, put a lot of effort in the business that I had at the time. And God, if I could just walk away from ministry, I would be okay with it at that moment. And I'm sitting at a Starbucks, and I wish I could go back to that Starbucks today and just hug them. Because at that table, God, I begin to weep. I begin to, I, I begin to have a moment. I begin to have a moment where he touched my blind eyes again. 
because I, could, I wasn't seeing clearly. And I had a moment with Jesus and he began to download some prophetic vision into my spirit. And a supernatural optimism came in me like, okay, I get it, God, we can do this. And I promise you, everything that we're doing today, it, it was at a Starbucks table on a napkin. That's why our first core value at this church is we live for the dream of the napkin. Those moments where God just drops into our spirit, where God just does something supernatural, where we cannot deny his power and his presence. So I came back and all through 2010, we began to restructure. We began to take that small group of people that we had at the time and we began to pray and we began to build vision around the four cups, the four winds to know God, find freedom, discover purpose and make a difference. Up to that point, we did not have that. And we launched 2011 on February 6th. I'll never forget it. Super Bowl Sunday, game day. Does anybody remember game day? Right? Just a few of you. But God began to break something. There was a barrier that broke and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people began to come into our small church and now thousands of people come into our church and thousands are being set free. And now we have great influence over our cities. Come on, I'm telling you, the progress and the faithfulness of God is still supernatural. Come on, can we just give God some praise?